We are so glad that you came out to church tonight. I'm glad that you came out to church tonight. And um, just a couple things real quick before we get started uh, tonight. Um, d men, don't forget about Forged Men's Ministry. We are having a barbecue cook-off. And I have heard that there's some registries that, you know, have really been, been, been uh, a, uh, up the ante just a little bit. I'll put it that way, I guess. So you better bring your A-game voice. All right, guys. So no, come on out to that, whether you want to compete or whether you just want to eat ribs and there's going to be brisket and there's going to be uh, Boston butt and there's going to be all kinds of stuff. Okay. I never knew there was such a thing called Boston butt. Okay. That almost sounds like something you wouldn't even say in church. Just saying. But I guess it, it, it's not only a thing, it's a really good thing. I've had it and it's really good, but uh, I've never known that before. I guess, I don't, I don't know, Iowa boy, I guess. But um, would you do me a favor? If you're here tonight, I want you to turn around. Well, if you're here tonight. <laughs> you if you're here tonight, I, I, that's questionable, actually. <laughs> would you just take a minute and... Stand up and, you know, greet maybe a couple, three people. If there's someone you don't know, go introduce yourself. Make sure they feel like family tonight. I'm going to be preaching right to you all night long. He's going to stare. He's going to stare at you. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Now it feels like church. Now we can get started. So, so tonight, you know, one thing when we were worshiping tonight that really got me is, you know, don't ever be afraid to worship. Don't ever be afraid to cut loose. Don't worry about what so-and-so behind you, beside you, in front of you, around you might think or say or act or do. Just worship. Now, I'm not saying that means you have to be front and center right here. But you know what? Some of you guys might, and I'm, I am saying guys, I said that, you know, there is a male and a female species, and I'm talking about, when I say guys, I'm talking about males. Okay? This altar, you can come up here. And you actually won't get struck by lightning, I promise. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and you really won't, um, you won't, you won't look like a fool like you think you might. But in all honesty, you might actually, you might actually get something from it. You might actually get something that you hadn't ever received before. You know, there's, there's, there's freedom when we worship God. There's freedom when we do things in worship that maybe we hadn't done before. And I'm not saying you're doing it to put on a show, far be it. But there is freedom when you can come before the altar and you're not ashamed to do so. You know, even Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power under God unto salvation. God wants you, and that word salvation is not just a ticket to heaven. We already talked about that, right? And there's freedom when we come into God's presence. And there's freedom when sometimes we do things that we didn't used to do before. Believe me, I was a good Baptist boy once. And then something happened. But that something was Jesus, and that something was freedom. And that something was not caring about what somebody else might think. Because that used to entrap me, that used to enslave me, that I felt like I had to be a certain way and act a certain way in church. Well, you know, the only time that is is when you go to a church, a church of the frozen chosen, okay? That is not family church, okay? That is the church down the road somewhere. <laughs> and I'm not going to say which direction, because I'll get in trouble. So anyway, that's just what I wanted to say about that. So, oh, barbecue, men's barbecue is this Saturday, starts at 
five o'clock if you're going to eat, okay? Um, which you always want to get here early. I'm just saying, you know, there's food. I mean, and not just food. We're talking ribs. Well, we already said all that. Okay, so five o'clock, guys. Get registered if you can. You can go online and do that, familychurch.tv. If you need some help, let somebody know. We'll help you. But I'm going to get right into my message tonight because I'm, I'm running out of time. So I want, or I'm eating into my time. So last week, or we have been in a series called The Name of Jesus. And really, the whole point of this series has been discipleship. Disciples teaching disciples. Because you know what? You got to know stuff to be able to teach stuff, right? And so we kind of dived a little deeper than some of the stuff we've been talking about with discipleship, but that was intentional because I think there's a lot in the name of Jesus that hasn't been taught in a very, very long time. And I think it's beneficial that we go back and we look at some of this stuff. So we said that by the cross, Jesus gave us the legal contract of access to his name with his personal endorsement. It doesn't matter if you, ha- if you sinned, if you haven't sinned, if you've lived uh, a clean life, if you haven't lived a clean, it doesn't matter. This is in the word. And how many know that the word of God doesn't change? How many believe what the Word of God says? I think we need to get back to believing what the Word of God says. Not by what we see, not by what we feel, not by our personal experience. Not because maybe something didn't go the way you thought it should go. God's Word is true. Period. Yes? Okay. By the cross, Jesus gave us the legal contract of access to His name with His personal endorsement. Jesus obtained a more excellent name, and we talked about what that excellent name is. We talked about the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. We said that we are Jesus' representatives, his ambassadors. We said that Jesus gave us his name to dominate over the thief in our lives. And we talked about the fact in 1 John 4, 17 says, As Jesus is right now, so am I. And that's not my words. That's in in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. And we then last week we talked about in the name of Jesus, we have healing, and not just healing, but we have divine health. You can walk in health, you don't have to be sick. You know, Kenneth Hagin, he wasn't bragging, he wasn't trying to be braggadocious by any means, but he said, I went 45 years and never had never had even a headache. You know, he wasn't being braggadocious, he was saying, you can walk in divine health by the power that is found in God's word in the name of Jesus. And it just doesn't have to be Kennedy A. It can be Kevin Ranfeld. It can be Phyllis. Right? It can even be Ariana. That took a lot for me to say. Just kidding. You know, but not only do words have meaning, did, or, or, I'm sorry. Okay, I forgot to put, I, I deleted when I deleted something, I deleted the, the, the um, part of my notes, which was um, supposed to have in there. Words are powerful. How many know words are powerful? Words have meanings, of which sometimes I use the wrong word for the wrong meaning. I've been guilty of that a lot. Yeah. And sometimes the word that I'm thinking of isn't the word that comes out of my mouth. But not only do words have meaning, words are powerful. You know, there's a saying out there that says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's hogwash. Words have the power to stick in you and stick with you way longer than any broken bone. I know people with broken bones. And I know those same people a few years later that are playing soccer again, that are playing baseball again, that you look at them, there's no visible appearance that a bone has ever been broken unless maybe you do an x-ray, right? But there's nothing. How many of you have been more than 20 20 years and still had words that haunted them? Words are powerful. Let me give you an example. I'm going to ask the guys to come out here a little bit. I want to introduce you to someone tonight. No, it's not Jackie, nor is it Ryan. Come right over here, gentlemen. I want to introduce you to Harry. Harry, no, stand him up. There you go. Hold him up. There you go. There you go. Harry. Okay. I don't know if we can get a tighter. Oh, there's no one on the camera tonight. Never mind. Okay. This is Harry. Harry has a problem. Harry gets made fun of a lot. 
And you know, if I was to come across Harry, you know, words hurt us. And words can hurt Harry. Like those stupid glasses that Harry has. <laughs> now, we could, we could maybe even say that, you know, Harry has a really hard, bad hairdo. But you know, Jackie may just wish he had hair. But you know, look at, look at Harry's hands. I mean, they're so small. Wow. Harry, you're stupid. You're an idiot. Words hurt, don't they? You know, though, I've been thinking about Harry. I really shouldn't be that mean to Harry, should I? I'm, I'm, I'm actually starting to feel bad for Harry. I mean, he can't help that he's ugly. So I'm really thinking I need to do something to try to mend this. Try to fix it. In fact, you know, maybe... Maybe I could even come up with a, a few band-aids of apology here tonight. You know, Harry, I'm sorry. I know you can't help your ugly glasses. I know your mom, you know, picked them out for you. And, and I un understand honoring moms, okay? So I just want to tell you, Harry, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really, really sorry that I picked on you about your glasses. Well, let's, let's, let's try one more. You know, Harry, I shouldn't have called you ugly. Your hair really isn't that bad. In fact, you know, I, I used to have one of those parts like that, like back in 82. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry, Harry, about that comment about your hair there. That really isn't doing that great of a job, is it? Let, let, me, let me try something else. Maybe, maybe this will work. I mean, Harry, I am so sorry about calling you nasty and inconsiderate and, you know, that your hands were small. You, you, can't, you can't really help that, can you, Harry? Dang, Harry, you're hard to fix. See, if I can do this. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we can, will that, will that work better? Maybe like this. Harry, I'm really sorry. <laughs> now, I tried my best to make things right. But is Harry the same as he was before? You see, the point of the, the deal is, is once we say words that hurt people, even going back and trying to fix them doesn't make it all better. Harry will never be the same. And you know, some of the same words spoken over us can have that kind of impact. Some of you have been prey to that. Words that have haunted you and really just never really go away. And you know, some of the very words that we have said about others have had the same effect because words have power. Thank you guys. Give them a hand. They did a good job holding Harry. Tonight, we're gonna study in our ongoing discipleship about words. In fact, the title of my message tonight is The Power of Confession. There's power in our words. I'm going to challenge you to take some notes tonight. Some of this may be things you have never, ever heard before. This was something as I went to Bible school and learned 
for some of the very first time, first time in my life became so very real to me in a way that really changed me. It changed my outlook. It empowered me that I have never had a bad day since that point in time. And I'll tell you why. We'll get to that in a minute. So take some notes because this is life-changing stuff. It was for me. And I hope it is for you. Because words have power. In fact, God established this from the very beginning of the written word that we have as record in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, actually. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Drop down to verse 6. Then God said... Let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. Verse 9, then God, what? Said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so dry ground may appear. And that is what happened, period. Verse 11, then God, you guys can do better than that. You're a Wednesday night crew. Come on. Then God, There we go. Let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kind of plants and trees from which they came. And this is what happened, period. Just by him speaking. Verse 14, then God said. Oh, yeah, you're getting warmed up now. Let the light, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Drop down to verse 20. Then God, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. Verse 22. Then God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Verse 24. Then God, Let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals, and that is what happened. Then God, verse 26, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Genesis 1, 26. Drop down to verse 28. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Do you get the picture? God spoke and it was created. It happened. There is power in God's words. He spoke and it was created. There's power in God's words. And in the very example of scriptures I just provided, there's also a key verse. Verse 26, where it says, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. From the beginning, God showed us the power of words. And not just God's words, but we are created in God's image. So that would mean our words have power as well. Our words have power as well. We're going to talk more about that later, but even science behind the spoken word reveals its very character and nature. The spoken word produces sound waves, okay? Much like the visible waves in water, though a lot faster. And just like waves in water, though the shape and size may change, a wave in the ocean never stops or never ceases to exist but it's perpetual as long as there is medium for it to transfer. Sound waves are very similar. Sound waves travel, travel through mediums such as gas, liquid, or, and even, or even a solid. Though a sound wave may change in frequency that is no longer audible to the human ear, it never ceases to exist. It continues to travel as long as the medium exists for it to transfer. So the very nature of the spoken word appears to never cease to exist or to never stop. Your words live forever. 
So if that's true, what about Jesus? Would he be a good example to look, to look at as far as the power of words? Anybody get a hand that we could do that? So what happened when Jesus spoke? Let's take a look. Actually, I just chose really one gospel, the gospel of Mark, as an example for tonight. In chapter 1, verse 23, suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him, or he said, Be quiet, come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed through the man into a convulsion and then came out of him. Words of Jesus spoken. Verse 27, amazement gripped the audience and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this, they asked excitedly. It has such authority. Evil spirits obey his orders, his words. Verse 40, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. When Jesus spoke. Verse ch chapter ten, 2, verse 10. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We have never seen anything like this before. Verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 38. There was a leader in the synagogue whose child was deathly ill. They came to inquire if Jesus would come. Jesus went, but by the time Jesus got there, they received news that the child was already dead. Jesus assured them not to be afraid. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said, Talitha Kaum, which I probably just butchered, which means, little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Again, Jesus spoke. Chapter 7 of, Mark, of the book of Mark, chapter 30, verse 33, Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears, then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, I think, which means be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly when Jesus spoke. Matthew or Mark chapter 9 verse 25 when Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing he rebuked the evil spirit listen your you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak he said I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again then the spirit cry, screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him the boy appeared to be dead a rumor ran through the crowd and people said he's dead but Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up Mark 11, chapter 12, it's, or ch chap Mark chapter 11, verse 12. The next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs, but there was only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit, your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Jump down to verse 20 of that same chapter. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree, he had cursed. The disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Again, the power of Jesus' words when he spoke. And the thing that really hit me somewhat later in life about this verse that we just read was the fact that Jesus spoke this over a tree that was not even in season to produce fruit. I would almost think, venture to say, Jesus knew that the tree wasn't in season to produce fruit. So it really wasn't the tree's fault. It wasn't unhealthy. It wasn't about to die. It was, just wasn't the right season. 
Yet the power of Jesus' words caused the tree to wither and to die from the roots. Man, that's power. Can you see that? That's power. But Jesus didn't stop this with this right here. Jesus went on. The same power of Jesus' words Jesus gave to you and me. Look at Mark chapter 11 in the next verse. I'm going to pick up right after verse 21. In verse 22, he says, Jesus said to his disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will. Do you see that right? Is that what that says? I tell you the truth. You can say to the, now surely the writer meant to say that Jesus said it might happen. Surely that's, the, that's just a wrong translation. No? No, they got it right. What does that say? I tell you the truth. You can say to the mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will, will happen. But you must really believe it. It will happen it will believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. The same power in Jesus' words is the same power in our words that we speak. Did you hear that? He gave that power to you and to me. He gave that power. So what does the power of words have to do with the power of confession then, Kevin? Confession, simply put, is speaking God's word over you, your life, or your circumstances. You can even confess God's words over others as well. Let me show you this. We see the power in confession first in the experience of salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and I'm reading from the Passion Translation tonight with this verse. And what is God's living message? It is the revelation of faith for salvation, which is the message that we preach. For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will experience salvation. The heart that believes in him receives the gift of righteousness, of the righteousness of God, and then the mouth confesses resulting in what salvation we do not have salvation without confession that's in the word our relationship with jesus begins with confession there is no remission of sin without confession there is no due birth without confession we are not saved as we know the word as we resort back to christianese talk without confession so the power of confession results in our salvation. W.E. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words gives this meaning for confession translated from the verse that we just, the passage that we just read. It says to declare openly by way of speaking out freely, such confession being the effect of deep conviction of facts. Did you get that? Deep conviction of facts. There is power in confession of God's word. Just as Jesus exercised with his words power over sickness and disease, he has given you the same authority in his name. The mountain of sickness, that mountain of disease has to go when we speak the name of Jesus and the authority in that name. The mountain of demonic oppression or evil must go when we speak the name of Jesus and the authority in that name. It doesn't have to be spooky. It doesn't have to be scary. We just speak the name of Jesus and it has to obey. Did it, do it, did it do it for Jesus? He said, it'll do it for you too. How do you know? Mark eleven twenty two 22 and 23. He granted that power to you. He said, not only will my words work and speak this kind of power, you can say, as long as you believe and you don't doubt, you can have it. 
That's confession. That's where the power of confession lies. And when we confess God's word, how many, we just established earlier tonight, God's word is true, right? Right? I saw two nods. Okay, all right, just want to make sure. God's word is true. Okay, so we can confess God's word because there's power in confession of God's word. Whatever the word says, I confess, and that mountain that is in front of me has to move, it has to go when I confess God's word. Because God's word is either true or it's not. We already established it's true, so we confess God's word. There's power in our words. There's power in that word. When we send it, the Bible says it will not return void. My word will not return void. When we confess, we have to confess, though, in confidence. We have to confess in confidence. The enemy knows when you're not. He knows when you're not. Hebrews 4, 14, New American Standard says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Okay, if I got to hold fast to something, I got to hold on to it, right? I got to grab onto it and not let go, right? Adam, come on up here. We're going to see how well this works. You should be. <laughs> so, in other words, if I'm going to hold on to something, I'm going to have to grab on tight and not let go. Okay? Even if things get hard. Come on, try to walk away. Come on. Even if things get hard, I got to keep holding on. Right? Holy cow. Got to keep holding. Got to hold fast. <laughs> right? That's the best way I know to, to, to illustrate that. Thank you. Give Adam a round of applause. He did a good job. He just drug like 190 pounds or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Shh. No, I'm just kidding. Not today. Tomorrow? I don't know. Hebrews 4.16, Therefore let us draw near with what? confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Kenneth Hagin, out of his book that I've been using to teach this series on, said Christian Christianity is a confession. Let us hold fast to the witnessing and confession of our lips. Let us hold fast to saying who we are and what we have because we are in Christ. See, it's not about you. It's about the authority that Jesus has given you in his name. And we are, if you're a Christian, if you're a born again believer, you are in Christ. So this verse is speaking to you, or, or this verse is speaking to you when it says, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so we may receive. You are in Christ. Let us hold fast to the faith of our confession. Why? Because you are in Christ. Not because of your own, okay? Let us hold fast to saying who we are and what we are and what we have because we are in Christ. God is moved not by need. This is me now. God is moved not by need, but by faith. That's another teaching, but I, I've taught this before, but that's another teaching in itself. God is moved not by need. We didn't have any needs. Do we have needs in this world? Yes. If God was moved by need, there wouldn't be any needs. Because he's all-powerful, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he can do it all. But he's not moved by needs, he's moved by faith. Kenneth E. Hagin goes on and says, our faith is measured by our confession. Our faith is measured by our confession. And the willingness, or the, uh, the ability, not the willingness, but the ability to stand and hold fast to that confession because the enemy is going to drag you through some mud. Can you hold on? I had, a, I had an old preacher that we stayed with when I was in Bible school. He was old then, okay? Um, and he had this story that he would tell, say about this little rat terrier that he grew up with. And they had these, these tea towels that they did dishes with. How many know what a tea towel is? Okay, had these tea towels that they did dishes with. And he said, that old little rat terrier, he said, you just dangle that tea towel, man. He'd try to grab it, he'd try to grab it. Finally, he'd get a hold of it. And man, he said, you could just, you could lift that dog right up off the ground and he would not let go of that tea towel. 
He said he'd begin to, to wave that thing, and that dog would just stay out of her, and he wouldn't let go. He said he would get it, and he'd swing it all the way around like this. He said that dog would not let go. Hold fast. Huh? You know, you got to have confidence that you're going to stay on to there if you've got to go, whoo, right? I don't know that I have, and I think that's where sometimes we miss. I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes we miss. We got to hold fast to our confession of faith. And our faith is measured by our confession because our confession builds confidence. It builds confidence. The people you hang, let me, let me give you another example. The people you hang with are going to influence you. Yes? Come on. We know that. It's why we hang around the right people. It's why we got to change who we hang around, right? Because they influence us. What you confess is going to influence you and your ability to hold fast or not. It's the same principle because the words you speak is going to influence you. If you talk about that deadbeat job you have every day, guess what? You're going to have a deadbeat job every day. But you don't have to change jobs. You just have to change your outlook. You got to change your confession. Man, this job may not be the greatest job. It may not be the best job, but I'm going to make it the best job today. That's why I said I haven't had a bad day. Because you know what? I may have some bad circumstances that happen in my life, but I refuse to let it ha- make me have a bad day. I decide if I'm going to have a bad day or not, and I choose not to have a bad day. That's my confession. And that's where my level of faith will rise to. Kenyon, E.W. Kenyon says, there is a grave danger of our having two confessions. One would be in the integrity of the word, and the other would be of our fear and doubts. Every time we confess weakness and failure and doubt and fear, we go to that level of them. We may pray very ardently and very earnestly and declare in our prayers our faith in the word, and yet the next moment we question whether he heard us or not, for we confess we have not the things for which we prayed. Our last confession destroys our prayer. One asked me to pray for his healing. I prayed for him, and then he said, I want, to keep, I want you to keep on praying for me. I asked, them what he w- I asked him what he wished to pray for. He said, oh, for my healing. I said, prayer will no- be of no value. You have just denied the word of God. The word says that they believe, that they that believe shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name that I will do. I prayed the prayer of faith and he denied it. But his confession, by his confession, he annulled my prayer and destroyed the effect of my faith. Your confession must be absolutely agree with the word. And if you have prayed in Jesus' name, you are to hold fast your confession. It is easy to destroy the effect of your prayer by a negative confession. Do you hear that? Let's say Ariana wanted this roll of tape. Ariana, you don't have to come up here. Well, I don't know. Maybe you do because they might. Oh, there's somebody there. Okay, never mind. So, Ariana, yes. would you like this tape? Sure would. Okay. You would like this tape? Yes, please. Can you say, can I have this tape? Can I have that tape, please? Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> now, would you please ask me for that tape again? Can I please have the tape? Why the heck did you do that? But do you need the tape? Absolutely. <laughs> Why do you have to ask me for something you already have? Because you told me to. <laughs> <laughs> and this, my friends, is what the average Christian is like in their prayers. Not to pick on, pick on Ariana, but I guess I just did. Yeah, Courtney, she's going to use that, need that tape. And she... She'll never be the same. 
That's okay, I'd rather have this crowd than the Frozen Chosen, so we'll, be, we'll go with that. Do you see how silly that is, though? And yet we, we as Christians do that with our prayers all the time. If she's already got the tape, she doesn't have to ask me for it again, does she? If I believe God's word is true and I ask him for something, then what do I do? I make sure my confession stands there. I make sure after that, if I've asked God for something, from that point forward, I say, God, even though I have not maybe seen it in the flesh or my manifestation of it, I don't see it with my eyes. I believe that your word is true, and I believe your word is true, and I thank you, God, for the answer. That's my confession. I don't have to ask for anything again. I thank him for what I already received by faith. Well, how does that work? I don't understand that. Do you remember the story of Daniel? And how Daniel prayed? And how an angel finally came? And what did the angel tell Daniel? If you remember the story, you can go back and read it because it's a little even foggy on my, on my memory, okay? So I may not have every jot and tittle right with this from my memory. But basically, the angel said, listen, I was dispersed the moment you prayed. But the prince of the power of the air of Persia delayed me from coming. The point is, guys, is we may not always understand what's going on, but there's stuff going on because prayer works. But sometimes I think our angel is up there and you have a need. Tape. And Ariana says, can I have some tape? Lord, I need some tape. Would you provide some tape? And the angel is dispersed. And he's running to get that tape. And maybe he's got to go a little diversions here, a little bit of diversions here. And all of a sudden, Ariana says, well, I guess I'm not going to get that tape. Just nullified the prayer. Lord, can I have that tape? Okay. The angel goes again. And, we're coming out. and it takes a little while. It takes a little while. And there is, God's not going to give me that tape. Again? Really? Some of us have trained our angels to be marathon runners. <laughs> and all he's waiting for is just enough faith to make it there in time. And it's all from the confession that we make because there are power in our words. There, are po there is power in our words. Just as there is power, sorry guys, just as there is power in our words, I lost track of time just a little bit, to bring life, there is power in our words to bring death and destruction as well. Proverbs 8, 20, 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. What does that mean? You can speak death or you can speak life right out of your same mouth. And whatever you speak is what you're going to produce. That's why I'm very hesitant. I know you can get on a really religious horse with this, okay? And you can say, you're a fanatic. You're just a crazy charismatic. And you can label me any kind of label you want. But you know what? I am very hesitant to say, man, that scared me to death because there's power in my words. You may say, oh, Kevin, you're hogwash. Maybe so. But I'd rather not be scared to death. Sometimes we have to watch our power of confession. Because there are people that pray and they walk away and they doubt from the very beginning of that prayer that God was going to answer it. Maybe because they felt like they weren't worthy. Or maybe because they felt like they've just done too much in their life. That God doesn't listen to their prayers. Let me tell you something. We went through all that we went through to get really to this point, which is there is nothing you can do to nullify you from access to God's throne because he canceled your debt. That's what remission of sin is all about in the name of Jesus. 
You're over there sitting in your pile of word I can't say in church and saying, I have all this stuff going on in my life. There's no way God can use me. And God is like, I don't see anything that he's talking about. Because why? Because he said he's chosen to cast that thing into the sea of forgetfulness. Does that mean God has a bad memory? No, he chooses to forget it. And he doesn't know a thing of what you're talking about. Because he sees you as a child of God. He sees you as white as snow. He sees you like you never did anything before because you are a new creature. That old one is dead. And God is a God of the living and a God of creation. He is not a God of death. You see, they had it wrong in the Old Testament because they didn't really know about Satan and his power. They blamed God on things that weren't God's fault. He allowed it because of justice and a whole lot of other stuff that we don't have time to get into in certain cases. But you've got to understand this. God is a God that creates. He never destroys. God is a God that creates the word and the words never cease. Are you with me? James 3 verse 9 says, Sometimes, talking about our tongue, it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. We're running out of time, but there's a saying, you are what you eat. But concerning the power of confession, I would challenge you, you are what you speak. Stand up on your feet with me, would you? Father, I just thank you. Lord, I've done my best to try to present this in the power that is in this subject matter to my family tonight in the best way I know how. And God, I know there are hurdles and I know there are things that maybe are standing in the way of all of this, but God, at the same time, just as I shared my testimony and my story of lots of reasons to doubt your word, lots of reasons to say it can't be true because it didn't work in my life, but God, I have come to the result and the conclusion that it's not you that's at fault. And sometimes we may not know who, what, or when is at fault, but God, that your word is true. And Father, that there is power in our words as we speak them. And God, that you desire to change the worlds that we live in by the power and the confession of our words. And so tonight, Father, I pray that revelations have just went off in this room like crazy. And Lord, that you are taking your family, your kids, from death to life tonight. That, Father, you are showing them a better way that they have to live. That they don't have to live in defeat. They don't have to live in overwhelmed um, um, depression or anxiety or stress or circumstances that are negative. But God, there is power in their words. They literally have the ability to change their world in their own mouth. That Father, tonight, that revelation would begin just to stir up inside of their spirit. And starting tonight, May 19th, 2021, would mark a change, a difference maker a pivot point that would begin to take steps to change the world they live in. Because God, you made your kids to be more than overcomers. You have said greater works shall I do. And so God, I pray tonight for my family. That Lord, whatever that hurdle is that the enemy has presented them with that said you are not going to cross that that tonight would be the pivot point to say, I'm not only going to cross it, I am going to skyrocket over it. Because it's not by might, nor it's by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit on the inside of me that's going to enable me to do it 
And I have learned a key and a tool to use to join with that Holy Spirit. And there is nothing that is going to stop me now. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Amen. Amen. I hope this helped. Like I said, it changed me. It changed my thinking. It changed my outlook. It changed my life. And I hope it is for you too. On your way, excuse me, on your way out, I've created a handout for you of confessions. You can start today. It's confessions based on God's word. The ushers have them. You're going to hand them out at the doors, fellas. Okay. They have them at the doors. Grab one on your way out. Um, Don't forget about the barbecue Sunday. See you back here. Again, somebody you don't see or know tonight. Hey, don't. Barbecue Saturday, Sunday service. Sorry. God bless you. You're dismissed.